Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session on estates, succession and de facto claims. How to protect beneficiaries, a family, law and wills and estates holistic approach. My name is Alicia Tobity and I am a partner in the Private Clients Group. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on this land, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I will be joined today by my colleague, Chris Savolis, who is also a partner in the Private Clients Group. Before we get started, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to ask questions anytime during the webinar by typing in your questions into the box found on the control panel. We will endeavour to answer your questions at the end of our presentation. You will also receive a copy of the slides and the recording post-event. We'd also appreciate if you could fill out a short survey upon the conclusion of our presentation. Now let's start. This seminar will be presented in two parts. Part one focuses heavily on a fictional case study which endeavours to present the various risks and issues. Part two will focus on how the main players in our case study would have been best protected and we will discuss how testamentary trusts intersect with family law. We have built today's seminar around a case study scenario. All names have been changed to protect the innocent and not so innocent. As we navigate through the scenario, think about how you would handle your client's concerns and draw your mind to the type of advice you would give. This is not an unusual scenario. And in fact, it's rather typical. You may have already encountered a case similar during the course of your practice and situations like this will pop up all the time. Depending on how you handle the situation as advisors has the potential to affect the family's future generational wealth. By the end of today's seminar, we hope to be able to have provided you with practical tips, strategies and guidance which will better assist you when dealing with these types of matters in the future. Now let's talk about the scenario facts. You have been managing the Thompson family wealth for close to 10 years. The Thompson family own a farming and agricultural business which has passed through the family for generations. The Thompson family comprise of Ron, who was the family matriarch, aged in his, sorry, patriarch, aged in his 70s. Ron's wife, Sue, died two years earlier, making Ron a widower, and she left her entire estate to him. Ron and Sue have three children together who are now adults. Mark, Steve and Annie are all aged in their 40s. They are all married and have several minor children amongst them. Can I have the next slide, please? Mark, Steve and Annie have approached you with concerns about Ron becoming rather amorous with a new lady friend called Sally, who was also aged in her 40s. They tell you that Sally and Ron have been spending a lot of time together and that Sally spends overnight time with Ron at the farm sometimes twice or up to three times a week. Ron has recently introduced Sally to the wider family and Sally has also been attending family events and accompanying Ron to other social events. Mark, Steve and Annie are all worried about what this may mean for the succession of the family business and their entitlements in relation to it. Now, I'll just give you a brief moment to try and mentally unpack that scenario before we talk about the main issues that we see that require consideration. Let's now briefly explore the main issues. First up, there are initial questions that I always consider when a scenario like this pops up. Before any advice is given, I will generally walk the clients through the following three questions. What if Sally moves in with Ron? And what if they get married? But what if they separate? 
And then what will happen if Ron dies before Sally and they are either married or still in a relationship at the time of his death? Ultimately, how we deal with these three questions, the advice we give and the strategy we put in place is largely the same for each case. Once we have considered those three questions, we need to start making some assessments and asking the clients for further information around what, if any, are the arrangements currently in place concerning the involvement and succession of the family business. Do they have any particular expectations about what that is going to look like for them? And then once we have assessed and reality tested those arrangements and expectations, we need to start thinking about the various strategies that will need to be put in place to protect the assets of the family business and in turn the future generations of the beneficiaries. Now I want to delve into each of those three primary considerations. So what if Ron and Sally start living together? And what if they get married? What if they separate? And what will happen if Ron dies before Sally and they are either married or still in a relationship at the time of his death? Well, generally speaking, Ron should be advised to update his will to leave Sally an adequate gift. He should be advised that the quantum of the gift needs to be quite adequate enough to satisfy the needs test under the Family Provision Act. And this will ultimately reduce the risk of Sally making a claim against his estate, thereby diminishing future generational and beneficiary entitlements in the event they are still in a relationship at the time of his death. Now, simultaneously to updating his will, Ron should also be advised to enter into a binding financial agreement under the Family Law Act. And this will ultimately protect the family business and generational wealth in the event of a separation. And we will delve into binding financial agreements very shortly. Now, simultaneously in, into entering in the binding financial agreement, we'd essentially like Ron to also um, enter into a deed of release under the Succession Act. And this will protect the family business, generational wealth, and thereby his estate in the event that Ron dies after the parties separate. Lastly, Ron should be advised to remove Sally from his will immediately in the event of a separation. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, the second primary consideration is assessing the family expectations or arrangements concerning involvement and succession of the family business. Do they have any particular expectations and what do their expectations look like? Now, in this stage, it should be determined whether there is a current trust structure in place pertaining to the family business. It's very important to ensure that the trust structure is expressly documented like a discretionary trust, which will afford the ultimate protection. Unfortunately, there are cases where families will make informal arrangements amongst themselves, which is therefore called a constructive trust. And this is where problems arise. These types of arrangements become problematic in cases, for example, if Sally and Ron separate and a dispute then arises post separation as to whether an arrangement was in fact in place for the business to be handed down to Mark, Steve and Annie particularly in circumstances where, say, during the relationship, Sally was making significant contributions to the day-to-day -day operation of the business. It is not enough for Mark, Steve and Annie to claim a belief that the business would ultimately be handed down to them because this would diminish and therefore defeat Sally's post-separation interest and entitlement. This exact same situation was examined in the case of Hampton and Farley and others, where the son sought a declaration as to a constructive trust. In this case, the de facto husband, Mr Farley, owned a business called Farley and Son in a partnership with his son. When the de facto husband and the wife's relationship broke down, the de facto wife, Ms Hampton, commenced proceedings for a property adjustment in the family court. 
Mr Farley's son sought orders to the effect that he held all right, title and interest in Mr Farley's half share in the agricultural business and land by way of a constructive trust. The land in which the business activities were carried out represented half of the asset pool available for division between Mr Farley and Ms Hampton. The son sought that Mr Farley and Ms Hampton be stopped from denying the existence of the agreement between him and his son, giving the son's contributions to the business. Ms Hampton strongly denied the existence of such arrangement. And it was Mr Farley's case that his interest in the business assets were held on trust for the son, and therefore the assets available for, di for distribution between the de facto spouses were reduced. Now, financial advisors played a key role in the early advice that they provided to the parties in this case. It so happened that the father and son and each of their respective wives, including Miss Hampton, attended on a financial planner some five years before they separated and a report was prepared. Now, in that report, the father and son detailed their intentions with respect to their assets upon their death to the effect that the farm and business will be, were to be handed down through the family. Can I have the next slide? The court noted that the report created by the financial planner was a more reliable reflection of the intention of the parties. than does a version of those matters some seven years later when each party had a vested interest in suggesting a particular version of events. The report also included that Ms Hampton was to receive a $500,000 payment upon the husband's death and the right to occupy the family home. The real property was to be left in trust for the son's children. In the next case of Cleaver and Cleaver, the adult son of the marriage sought leave to intervene in proceedings between the husband and wife. It was his position that he held a constructive trust in the farming land of the family. The husband agreed with the son's claims. However, the wife fiercely opposed the contention that such a constructive trust existed. On the evidence, it was found that there was no promises or representations made to the son and therefore his application must fail. In the case of James, the title to farming property and the ultimate inheritance of the farming property was considered. The husband was of the view that the family's 50 acre orchard and grazing property would eventually be handed down to him in due course. The husband owned a half share in the business at the time of his separation, but he held no legal interest in the land. Now, after separation, the husband's father died and the husband inherited a 50% share in the proceeds of sale of the land, which amounted to $60,000, and this was quite a large sum of money in 1978. Interestingly, the court awarded Mr James's wife 33% of that inheritance in recognition of the wife's primary care of the couple's small children well into the future. As we often see, businesses have been in the family for years, sometimes for five generations or more. So this is why it's very important to implement strategies to protect these assets and also their claims as beneficiaries. But there are many competing interests. And in our case study today, Ron will have to juggle the interests of himself, Sally, and of course his children and grandchildren. It's important to remember that the family court can only make an order affecting the interests of the spouse parties, or in this case, Ron and Sally. Third parties who have an interest in the business assets, in this case, Mark, Steve and Annie, would seek to be joined to the action. Now, any family law property settlement between Ron and Sally in the event of a separation will affect the greater farming family. Ron may lose touch with his grandchildren if Mark, Steve and Annie shift away. If the, adult take, if the adult children take competing sides, a rift between the siblings may never be amended. This is why it is critically important early on in the piece to start strategically planning. 
the asset protection. And otherwise, by the time of Ron and Sally's separation or Ron's death, it may be too late. Whilst it is tempting for Ron, Mark and Steve, sorry, Ron, Mark, Steve and Annie, there's a lot of people here, to insist that Sally never had an interest in the business, in practice, the family has to recognise that some provision must be made for her, um, particularly if the relationship is to endure. Now, remember, Sally's in her 40s. She has considerable life expectancy left and she has time to make a real contribution to the business. The competing interest is that there has to be a way to compensate her on either a breakdown of the relationship or on Ron's death. Otherwise, they risk losing a lot. Next slide, please. So let's now talk about what is the best strategy to protect the family. Here are some practical tips. Can I have the next slide, please? Early on in the piece, Ron should be advised to enter into a binding financial agreement under the Family Law Act. Ron should also be advised to talk to Sally about his desire for a binding financial agreement. Ron and Sally should allow plenty of time to do this, months rather than weeks for the negotiations leading up to the signing of the binding financial agreement. If wedding bells can be heard tolling in the background, then they've left it too late. Ron should be prepared to pay a reasonable fee for the preparation of the binding financial agreement, and if necessary, to gift money to Sally if she does not have the finances to obtain her own specialist advice. Binding financial agreements are not boilerplate documents, and each one is incredibly complex. Ron should then engage a specialist family lawyer to prepare the binding financial agreement. And Sally will also need to engage her own legal representation. Indeed, it is a fundamental requirement in binding financial agreement cases that both parties receive their own independent legal advice. And we will talk about this a little later. Ron's lawyer must be aware of the need to enter into negotiations with Sally's lawyer rather than impose draconian take it or leave it terms, which could lead to allegations of unconscionable conduct and duress in the event the agreement is challenged in the future if the parties separate. Now, we also need to anticipate that Ron's tribe will almost certainly be involved in the background, giving endless advice, most of which will be unhelpful. Simultaneously to the binding financial agreement, the party should enter into a deed of release under the Succession Act, protecting the family wealth in the event Ron dies after the parties separate. Now let's turn our minds to the ins and outs of binding financial agreements. Very broadly speaking, binding financial agreements can cover matters such as spousal maintenance, property of the parties, which is either separate or joint property, child support and financial resources. And in particular, how those matters are to be dealt with following the breakdown of the relationship. The technical requirements for a financial agreement to be binding include a requirement that each party have received independent legal advice from a legal practitioner about the effect of the agreement on the rights of that party and the advantages and disadvantages at the time that the advice was provided to that party of making the agreement. In order to be able to advise a party of the advantages and, and disadvantages of entering into a financial agreement and how that agreement will affect their rights, it is first of all necessary that those advantages, disadvantages and rights are identified at the very beginning. There is, however, no express reference to the advice needing to be correct, proper, adequate, accurate or sound. But for matters of best practice, particularly when managing risk, I tend to strongly disagree. Make no mistake, binding financial agreements are incredibly risky documents and the risk is almost entirely borne by the legal practitioner. The adequacy of the advice given is often critical as to whether the agreement is actually binding or not. 
acting for a party in regards to a financial agreement, particularly a prenuptial agreement, requires time, care and full instructions. Whilst one or both of the parties may be keen to have lawyers draft and advise on their very simple agreement quickly, a failure to properly consider the party's circumstances and give sound and comprehensive advice can mean that these agreements are often ticking time bombs. The importance of this have been emphasised in many decisions. In Renard and Geach, Judge Small found that the husband had not been given independent legal advice. His solicitor was present at the trial and he gave evidence that his role was to give a certificate of advice to the husband on an agreement which had already been prepared by the wife's lawyer. The court disagreed with how the solicitor described his role and discussed the length of time spent advising the husband and the court concluded, it is difficult to see how that role could be fulfilled in even a 50 minute interview as it would require detailed instructions being taken as to the assets and liabilities of the marriage, the husband's current position and the history of the relationship even before looking at the agreement. And even on the solicitor's evidence, it was not in my view long enough to take a comprehensive instruction and give detailed and comprehensive advice about the agreement. Next slide, please. In the case of Kamal and Kamal, the legal advice given to the wife was found not to meet the fundamental requirements of the Family Law Act. The wife's legal practitioner readily conceded that he did not give the wife the requisite advice and he saw his role as only being a witness and explaining the terms and conditions. Although to do the latter, he only read out the agreement to the wife and told her it was binding. He said he didn't have the expertise to advise the wife on the matters required by the Act and would have required her to go elsewhere for that advice. In finding that the wife did not receive the requisite legal advice, the court was fortified in making that finding because it turned out that there were significant errors and inconsistencies in the actual agreement itself. The court held, in circumstances where the errors in the financial agreement relate to the proportions the parties were each to receive under the agreement. And the financial agreement itself was internally inconsistent with those proportions. I am not satisfied that Mr B, the solicitor, identified these errors such that he could have in any event properly explained them to the wife pursuant to those requirements. So unfortunately, the wife, not only did she not receive adequate advice, but the agreement was also defective. This is why it is critically important that when advising your clients who need asset protection when entering into a relationship, that you impress upon them the need to ensure that they engage an appropriately specialised family lawyer. It is extremely dangerous for the clients to take the cheaper option by engaging a generalist. Time and time again, I see financial agreements come across my desk many months or many years after they were entered into, the agreement having been prepared by a generalist. The parties are now separated and one of them, invariably the other party, wishes to have the agreement set aside. The client will come to me in a panic about this to see whether the risk, sorry, to see whether the agreement is at risk of being set aside. And I often already know that the client is in very serious trouble by just taking a cursory glance at the document. This now brings me to my next topic, being in what circumstances and on what grounds can a financial agreement be set aside? Broadly, financial agreements can be set aside in the following circumstances. If the agreement was obtained by fraud, including failure of the parties to provide one another with full and frank financial disclosure of their financial circumstances. If the agreement is void, voidable or unenforceable, usually in circumstances of where there are uncertain clauses in the agreement or the agreement is incomplete. 
if circumstances have arisen since the making of the agreement that make it impractical for the agreement or part of the agreement to be carried out, and if a party to the agreement engaged in conduct that was unconscionable. It is beyond the scope of this seminar to address all of these grounds, so we are just going to consider fraud, undue influence and unconscionable conduct. Next slide, please. Fraud and failure to disclose. If a party does not disclose their financial circumstances to one another, the agreement is at greater risk of being set aside. There must be full and frank disclosure of the party's financial circumstances. And this suggests that silence and a failure to disclose material facts amount to statutory fraud. And this position is clarified in the Family Law Act by specifying that fraud for the purpose of setting aside financial agreements can be constituted by material non-disclosure. Next slide, please. In Grant and Grant Lovett, the court found that despite the fact that the parties had been married for 12 years, this did not lessen the party's obligation to disclose, to disclose their financial circumstances prior to entering into the agreement. And in Park and Park, a financial agreement was set aside for non-disclosure or suppression of facts which amounted to a misrepresentation. The husband represented in Schedule 1, which purported to contain a list of all of his assets. The court found that this was untrue because he failed to acknowledge the self-managed superannuation fund of which both parties were members. But the wife didn't know of this fund's existence or even that she had a member's account. Now, the finding of the misrepresentation being false rather than unintentional was strengthened by the conduct of the applicant in the financial agreement proceedings where he did not disclose the fund and its existence was only discovered as a result of a subpoena to the husband's accountant. Next slide, please. Undue influence and unconscionable conduct. Now, much has been written about undue influence and unconscionable conduct since the 2017 High Court decision in Thorne and Kennedy. In Thorne and Kennedy, the High Court listed six factors which are prominent in assessing whether there has been undue influence in the particular context of prenuptial and postnuptial agreements. When taking instructions, negotiating, drafting and advising on financial agreements, the following matters need to be considered. Whether the agreement was offered on a basis that it was not subject to negotiation, the emotional circumstances in which the agreement was entered, including any explicit or implicit threat to end a marriage or to end an engagement, whether there was any time for careful reflection, the nature of the party's relationship and the relative financial position of the parties and the independent advice that was received and whether there was time to reflect on that advice. Next slide. So how have all of those considerations been applied following Thorne and Kennedy? Well, in the case of Chaffin and Chaffin, which was decided two years after Thorne and Kennedy, um, concerned a financial agreement entered into one week before the wedding when the wife was pregnant with the party's first child. The agreement was set aside for hardship and unconscionability, but not for undue influence. The wife signed the agreement in the, fact of, uh, in the face of strong legal advice that she should not do so. The husband discouraged the wife from telling her lawyer that she was pregnant. However, it is important to recognise that illegitimate pressure may also be felt by clients in other circumstances, not relating to threats to either cancel the wedding or end the marriage. Can I have the next slide, please? In the case of Cotsis and Cotsis, which was decided last year, the financial agreement was set aside for unconscionable conduct after it was signed by the wife seven weeks after the stillbirth of the party's child. The fact that she had agreed to sign it before the stillbirth was held to be irrelevant. 
The court found that the wife was held to be under a special disadvantage at the time she signed the agreement. And the husband took advantage of this and his acceptance of her assent to the agreement was exploitative and unconscientious. In the case of Baroni and Corelli of 2020, the full court of the family court considered the issue of the nature of the advice required in the context of a finding of undue influence and unconscionable conduct. In this case, the wife's first language was not English. It was found that a rudimentary explanation of the agreement was given to the wife in English. And although the legal practitioner had identified that an interpreter was required, there was no interpreter. The wife had not been given a copy of the agreement before signing it. And in any event, she was unable to read it. The agreement was 14 pages in length and the advice was given in a 30 minute discussion. The wife could not, in those circumstances, have, been, have had any real understanding as to the value of the entitlement she was giving up by signing this agreement. Now, undue influence was found because the general position of dominance which the husband had in relation to the wife, his insistence over a considerable period of time that the agreement be signed, and his later insistence that be signed without amendment, the wife's fear that he may inform immigration authorities that she was in breach of her visa conditions, and the husband and wife's knowledge that in order to obtain a permanent visa, the relationship needed to continue, but it could only continue if the agreement was signed. As the legal advice was inadequate and was insufficient to remedy the special disadvantages of the wife, it was suggested that there may be a move by the family law courts towards added emphasis on the advice requirement. The court will look closely at the agreement in circumstances where inadequate advice was given to a party at a special disadvantage and ultimately set the agreement aside for undue influence or unconscionable conduct. I will now hand over to my colleague, Chris Savolis, to talk about testamentary trusts, family trusts, and family law. Th thank you, Alicia. So, um, uh, thanks for guys today. So the key things to look back, obviously, um, family law is a significant issue and affects a number of our clients. The concerning thing, is that, as you would appreciate it from Alicia's discussion, that binding financial agreements are not always binding. They are um, always beneficial. However, they are often can be found not to be significant. And therefore, we need to look at other ways we can actually protect your clients. So best binding financial agreements are a speed hump. And realistically, you would have seen from a lot of those cases that Alicia described, for them to be effective, often they will almost need to be negotiated like a commercial contract. That's a very difficult thing for people to do, obviously. So it leads to what else could we do? So by reference to the case study that um, was at the first slide, we had the circumstances of Ron and Sue and Ron's subsequent relationship, which occurred later on, and um, what could he have done moving forward? Now, as part of Sue's will, when she passed away, she gifted all of her affairs to Ron. Now, as a consequence she, of Sue gifting all her assets to Ron, then when Ron entered into the subsequent relationship, it was not only his assets that he held in his personal name, but also the assets he inherited for Sue. In a usual fashion, Sue intended those assets to go through Ron, for him to join during his lifetime, and then them to flow through to his children, to their children. So what could have Sue done better? And the answer is, there's always trust. And trusts are a critical aspect of, a, of asset protection and a critical aspect of estate planning. There are many reasons people use trusts and many of your clients use trusts for tax planning and things of that nature. But asset protection is a growing um, issue in estate planning particularly. So, what are, so therefore, why um, can we use trusts? How do we structure them? And as you've probably heard and Alicia touched on, trusts can and often are challenged successfully by the family law court. So, what are some of the cases law about trusts and where can actually a trust be used successfully? Now, there's been a number of cases where the um, family law has court has considered trusts and private companies. 
And it's from these cases that we get the rule of thumbs and principles as to how we can potentially level, create a level of asset protection for any potential challenges which might happen for likes of a Ron in a, fa in a future uh, matrimonial relationship when his first partner spouse passed away. So what the case law tells us is when you look at trust, there are a number of key issues that need to be considered. And these are listed in these questions. The first and foremost thing is two things. The court always does take a substance over form approach. They will look at the trust deed. They will look at the tax returns to see who has benefited. The trust deed, who can benefit and who control the trust. And that's very important. But they also will look in substance which truly is around the relationship. And a key factor is that in doing so, that the parties to the relationship and more particularly the person who are, we want to protect has abided by the terms of the family trust deed. If the person who controls the family trust deed or, or other type of trust has not abided to the, the actual strict um, clauses and terms and conditions in the trust deed, then the argument could be that the trust itself is a sham and fails against any family law challenges. And there's cases on that. So the first and foremost is, it's really important that clients abide by trust deeds. And whilst all trusts are trusts, not all trusts are the same. It's literally determined by the terms in each trust deed, what every trustee can and cannot do and who are the beneficiaries. So assuming we've got a circumstances where there is a trust deed in place and the clients are abiding by the terms of the trust deed. So what do the courts look at? So the courts will always respect the terms of the trust deed. And if the clients have abided by them, so will the court. But then the court will look at the substance of the transaction. So they look at who truly settled the trust assets that are a part of the family trust. So for example, if, um, is, as is commonly the case, there is a family friend or a close associate who acts as a set law and gifts the initial settlement sum to trust, that is only one aspect the courts look at. They look at who truly settled the remainder assets. As many clients, what they usually set up is a discretionary family trust with $10 in there, for example, and then Subsequently, after the trust is established, they will transfer other assets or cash or lend money in and basically provide it with sufficient assets in there to actually start either running the business, make investments or anything of that nature. So the court looks at truly where did, the, where did the asset value come to actually get the family trust operational? Was it the set law, which is a nominal sum, or was it truly a family member? I, was it the patriarch or the matriarch, the person we're trying to protect? So the court looks at where did these assets come which you've got to go in? The court also looks at who truly controls the trust. You would have heard of the terms of trustee, appointor, principal, guardian. These are all terms that are commonly found in trust deeds, which refer to positions of control. Trustee, as you're aware, is who is, has a daily control of the trust, the assets are registered under the trust, and they make the decisions as to who benefits and what have you. Trustees will often have references to persons called an appointor, a guardian or a parent or something of that nature. Those roles are usually governing kind of roles where they either have the ability to restrict decisions of the trustee, whereby the trustee must go to those persons and get consent, for example, it could be to amend the trustee. And also those persons also usually have the power to appoint and remove the trustee. So they're the, the key position roles. So the court will look at say, who is a trustee? Is it an individual? Is it a company? If the company, who are the directors? Court will look at who are the ultimate governors who can actually appoint them with a trustee. Now, there is legally who's, who, is, who are the nominated as people, and then there's truly who are those people. It is often people who structure and I have maybe a family friend or an advisor or another sibling sitting in those roles of a director or, or a guardian or a pointer, and they might be there jointly or individually. But they're truly their position there is to create a, a level uh, of um, asset protection, whereby if you look at the strict terms of trust deed, the, the husband, as usually the case, does not control the trust. It might be the sibling or their parent or their accountant. In that case, who is a true controller? Now on the trust deed, legally, it is a person whose name is listed there. But the family law court will look beyond that and say true, truly is the, the, the controller. So the friend, or the accountant or whomever, the relative, who's sitting there as trustee or guardian, will often find themselves subject to being cross-examined in court to determine how do they operate that trust. Now, truth will always come out in those kind of scenarios because I will say ultimately, if they follow the lead of typically the husband in those cases, but grossly it would be the wife as well. 
So the court will say, well, it doesn't matter who the appointed legal person is as the controller of the trust, who truly controls the trust. The next question the court will look at is, who can benefit for the trust capital and the trust income? Now, capital is literally the amounts that have been gifted into trust and any accumulation of um, trust assets and can include, subject to the terms of the trust deed, capital gains, as in taxable capital gains and non-taxable gains. Once again, it always always depends on the terms of the trust deed. So they look at who are those capital beneficiaries. They'll also look at who are the income beneficiaries. And in the usual fashion, as you know, most trusts will differentiate between capital and income beneficiaries where the key family members, so it might be the soft loss family trust, where the capital beneficiaries are myself, my spouse and my children, or I might have excluded my spouse for a level of asset protection. But then the income beneficiaries would be other family trusts that I'm a member of, companies and things of that nature. So the court will look at that. The court will also look at who actually truly does benefit as well. The other thing the court looks at is when was the trust established? Was it before I was married, for example, or was it after I was married? So was a structure put into play after the matrimonial relationship or the de facto relationship, which might have been structured for the purposes of over, overcoming the family law proceedings? And also, what was the purpose? Can the court the, glean from all the surrounding circumstances why was this trust set up? Was it for an investment purpose? Was it for an asset protection? Was it to defeat the family law court? So weighing all those things together, and in most family trusts, what you find is the true set law is either the husband or the wife, the person definitely who actually wants to protect them. The true controller is actually either the husband or the wife, the person who's trying to protect those trust assets. The capital beneficiaries will often include that person and their family members. And whilst the trust was established for um, could be inserted for tax purposes, it doesn't matter. If it was established for asset protection purposes, then the family law court will actually pull it apart, even though it's developedly constituted and what have you. And that was found in the High Court case of Spry versus Pry. And um, Spry is a leading QC on the lawyer of trust law, so if he can't get around it, nobody can. So really important, what's the purpose and when it was established. So looking at all these factors together, where you have a family trust, which is, let's say, me, most of the assets have come in sourced from me, whether before or after my uh, matrimonial relationship, and I can benefit from the capital. And who does benefit in typical fashion every year from the income is determined by me. So that's where the alter ego principle, which you might have heard of, basically operates. And the court says, well, it's truly Chris's asset in that example. The family trust will therefore be included as the part of the matrimonial assets, which could therefore be subject to a claim being made against them. So that's the way the general operation, the family law court, will look at, at discretionary trust. But as I said, it's also critical what are the terms of trust deed and if there are third party interests. And that's really important because the next slide is say what could have been done to create a level of asset protection. So what if under Sue's will, instead of gifting everything to Ron, which is a standard husband and wife will or partner will, she established a testamentary trust. And what it is a test what a testamentary trust, it's a form of typically it's a form of discretionary trust which is established under a person's will. The words testamentary trust come from the terms last will and testament, therefore testamentary trust. Whilst many um, of the trusts are a form of discretionary trust, they can be fixed with very um, limited powers or fixed, but it's really dependent on the law firm which actually drafted them. Now, when Sue passed away, for our example purposes, let's say she held the family home or half the family home as joint tenants with, with Ron and a range of investment assets, maybe some shares or investment property, what have you. So what could Sue's will actually done to actually create a level of asset protection? So when after her passing away, if Ron entered into a new relationship like he did, he could at least protect her interests. What could, she, what could have her will contained and how does it apply in relation to the Family Law Act? Now, let's we go through the criteria now. Once again, we've got a list of these six facts that the court will look at. So let's just deal with the investment assets, shares at bank, um, sorry, cash at bank, investment um, property, um, ASX shares, anything of that nature, managed funds, what have you. So firstly, where did the assets come from? Who settled the trust? It might sound unusual, but the settler is actually the deceased person, it's Sue. So under her will, Sue's will would provide that instead of these assets being gifted to Ron, which was the case, that all these assets get gifted into the testamentary trust. So the actual seller is Sue. Now this is really important because this trust only come out in, into existence after Ron's death. And Ron here is a 
he's a passenger. He hasn't been actively engaged. He's there a mere recipient. So he's not driving this, this establishment of the trust. And that's important for point six, which is what's purpose and who established it. So it's been settled by Sue. The assets have come from Sue because they've come from her estate. Then we get to the other two factors of course that looks at who truly controls the trust and who can benefit from the capital and the income. In a similar fashion, like with family trusts, you have trustees, appointors, guardians, and things of that nature. So once again, you have the same issues as to not merely who is legally the nominated trustee or guardian or appointor, but also who truly does. So let's just say, typically the case, well, as far as Ron's concerned, as who's concerned, well, Ron should have control of these assets when he passes away. So we would expect Ron to be the true controller as well as the legal controller. Now, who can benefit? Now, both Sue and Ron, when they were doing their estate plan, were really cognizant of the fact that the survivor might enter into a new relationship. Now, this therefore comes back to how do we structure this testamentary trust having regards to the law we refer to. Now, if the trust included the capital beneficiaries as Ron and his children, then we come straight into a scenario where we have a trust which is controlled by Ron and Ron can benefit from the capital as well as income. This pretty much starts getting to a position, once again, the trust is Ron's alter ego. So even though he didn't set it up, even though it wasn't his assets, it is a vehicle where he can determine whether he benefits or not from the capital, which is inheritance or the income. So therefore, even though the perp, it was settled by Sue's assets, it was established by Sue, and it was her purpose and not Ron's, the mere fact that he controls it and he's a capital and income beneficiary means that the alter ego principle can still say it's fundamentally an asset which is um, Ron's personal asset and therefore would be available under a property settlement within the basket of assets that the family law court could look at. What percentage it was included is obviously subject to a whole range of factors, which is things like longevity of the relationship and, and with who has benefited traditionally, but it is up there as a risk factor. So if we go back to the this year that the courts have looked at in determining whether a trust can be challenged successfully or not, one factor is who is entitled to the capital. So if we have a trust set up under Sue's will, where Ron controls it as the trustee and or the guardian or appointor, but is not a capital beneficiary or has limited capital entitlements, with those capital entitlements fundamentally generation skipping for the benefit of his children, but Ron is otherwise an income beneficiary, then all of a sudden it's outside that normal alter ego principle because there's a limitation imposed upon Ron and what he, how he can benefit. So because of Ascot Investments, which is a whole case going way back to the 1970s, the Family Law Court says, well, if they are true legitimate third party interests, we cannot vary those interests. So once the, the capital rules are adjusted, then the Family Law Court will accept it. And all of a sudden, this, this testamentary trust and these assets are not automatically available or to Ron's partner. They're actually restricted and are restricted by reference to the value, the restrictions, the capital entitlement which exist. Now the income entitlement which Ron can still receive can be taken into account for things like space or mountain and other adjustments, but critically, the capital asset is now outside the normal basket in the ordinary fashion. And with respect to the family home, where Sue owned as joint tenants, let's say with Ron, a common strategy to that would be, would be to sever the tenancy from joint tenants to tenants in common, which basically means you still own the house half half, but when you die, Sue could gift her will where she wants to under will, as opposed to Ron automatically inherit it. And that could have been passed across to Ron through a, a life residency style of arrangement with a level of flexibility, where once again, Ron has a limited asset entitlement, which is he's got a right to reside, maybe rent it out and get income, but he's not entitled to the capital value of the home. That would then flow through to his children. So once again, due to Ascot Investments, the court would not, exhort, not ignore the legitimate capital interest as a remainder interest held by his children. So that all of a sudden that would start to create a level of asset protection for those assets and therefore creating a lot more benefit in, uh, for Ron in the future when he entered his new relationship. So that's a way we could have structured, for example, Sue's assets. What else could have happened if there was sufficient concern? What if, what if Ron and Sue had a family trust, which is not uncommon for farming clients or many other clients these days? So in the next slide, we'll look at what could have done, what could have been done in respect of a normal discretionary family trust. So let's assume we had a normal discretionary family trust for Ron and Sue prior to Ron and Sue's death. As part of their estate planning, they've mentioned their concerns should the survivor enter a new relationship and the desire for the survivor to benefit, but to try to protect those assets. Subject to the terms of the family trustee, its ability to be amended, 
then it's possible to amend the family trust state to build in restrictions, which become effective following the death of the first of one and two, which start limiting capital entitlements. Now this is consistent with the description we just did with respect to the testament trust, can actually start creating a level of family or asset protection. Not to the same extent to which it exists with the testamentary trust, because it's a trust fact, a trust which has got limited capital entitlements following Ron's engagement through the amendments. So that was part of his purposes. Now, whether it's effective or not, and how effective will be determined about the level of family law, um, sorry, the trust amendment power and the trust deed, and also future law, because cases like that really haven't hit the, the courts as yet. But those kind of cases can create a level of asset protection. Now, and subject to the terms of the power of amendment, as always. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, if I amend the class of beneficiaries, am I triggering a resettlement for taxation purposes? Now, that also comes back to, once again, the clause in the trust deed. After Clark's case made it very clear from a CGT perspective that subject to the terms of the trust deed and the power of amendment, you can do significant amendments to beneficiary classes where it was always envisaged that this would be allowable under the terms of the trust deed. In that case, you could actually restrict capital beneficiaries' rights, even though um, they were there from the day and they are the remainder interest, without actually triggering a deemed resettlement and therefore triggering a deemed capital gains tax event. So thereby could actually create a higher level of asset protection for the other assets which were not controlled by Sue's will. So what I've tried to do in these last three slides is literally look at certain scenarios where planning can create a level of asset protection for um, the client when they get on top of it quite early on. So hopefully we'll be able to help with that issue. Now I do note we have a couple of questions. Now the first question, Alicia, is for you. So I might read it out for everyone else. So the question is, in respect of binding financial agreements, is if your client is under a binding, is under a financial management order, what further steps, if any, are, are taken prior to signing the binding financial agreement of the client? I definitely have yeah, no idea with that, so Alicia. Yeah, no, I did have a, a, a quick look at this question. Now, my understanding is if someone is under the um, the effects of a financial management order, their wealth would be managed by the Department of New South Wales Trustee and Guardian, usually in circumstances where that person um, has a disability and because of those circumstances, they're unable to manage their financial affairs. So. On the question that you've given me, I have real concerns um, that a person who was who was under the control of the trustee and guardian would essentially be able to really enter into a binding financial agreement. Certainly um, on a prima facie basis, you'd have to get the trustee and guardian involved because they would essentially have to be the ones that would be making financial disclosure. Um, and it also really depends on the on the facts and circumstances of the relationship. Uh, the age of the parties and um, and and what you know the nature of the disability, uh, whether there's real cognitive impairment there, or you know whether it's a result of addiction or something like that. It, it all it's all it all very depends. But um, I just from from that question, it's it's making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I um yeah, I you definitely have to uh, resort to the um. New South Wales trustee and guardian, I think. There's another question here for you, Alicia. I might just quickly paraphrase it, re recognise the time. If there's a, a clients married in their late 50s, don't have, neither have children from former relationships or from that relationship, and um, they have different level of assets when they enter into the marriage, there is no binding financial agreement. How long, or what's the sliding scale to your best guesstimate that, you know, the, you start to you start shifting from you walk in from what will you walk in you walk out with to starts percentage shifting is it five years seven years ten years twelve years and I'm sure they're not the only factor the actual duration of the relationship. That's so right. What, what are your I, thoughts I, on that, when Alicia? I, when I looked at this question, it just occurred to me that that you're basing the, the um, entitlements on marriage. No. As soon as you guys start living together or as soon as there is some sort of emotional in interdependence there or as soon as you start you know proceeding out in public together as a couple and, and everyone knows that you guys are together that's when the clock starts um, it, it, it doesn't start um, you know at marriage um, so 
if there's no binding financial agreement in place, then absolutely all of the assets of both parties are up for grabs. And the court figures out who gets what or what entitlement the, the split of the matrimonial pool will depend on the contributions of the parties uh, during the relationship, after the relationship, and also the initial financial contributions at the onset of the relationship. So did either party have any um, you know, main assets of note on the commencement of the relationship? And also non-financial contributions are also really important as well. So homemaker and um, you, you know primary care responsibilities for the children, and also domestic duties and and you know maintaining the property and all of that sort of stuff is very important as well. Now the court's view is that non-financial contributions and financial contributions they are equal. So um, if somebody is a homemaker and their partner is out being the breadwinner, uh, just because that person, the homemaker, is not bringing money into the relationship, it doesn't mean that they're it doesn't mean that they're not contributing, and those contributions are seen to be just as important as financial contributions. Um, so I hope. I hope that answers your question. As I said, there's no there's no time limit, but as soon as as a de facto relationship is sort of recognised, um, as I said about emotional interdependence and whether you guys go out in public and present yourselves as a couple, that's when that clock starts ticking. Great, thank I you, Alicia. I just saw another question on here as well about that was the first question um, about who signs the deed of release. Um, good question. Both spouse parties sign the deed of release, as do uh, their respective lawyers. So the advice given um, in respect of the binding financial agreement that I discussed during the seminar, the same advice and the same quality of the advice needs to be given in relation to a deed of release. So the parties need to be advised on the advantages and disadvantages of entering into um, the deed of release and also how that deed of release affects their rights, as, rights and entitlements. So the, the level and the adequacy of the advice is just the same and just as important as it is with the binding financial agreement. Great, a uh, question for me. Um, if you have a testamentary trust which references a spouse as a beneficiary, can you remove them if a relationship sours? The, the back, this is the normal situation is, what does the trust deed provide? What are the powers? So if there is a power to amend and remove the, the spouse, the answer is yes, you can of the trust law remove them. What are the consequences from a family law perspective, whether that changes the risk profile on that trust, with those testamentary trust assets or not? Are subject to the terms of that trust, uh, of those trusts, and obviously from a CGT resettlement perspective, once again it comes down to what are the trust rules um, as to whether you, whether that would trigger a CGT. But once again, many um, it it all comes down to trust deed. There is a one final question there for Alicia with the minute we have. Uh, maybe over just a second. Okay, the. Um, there's an acronym here, so I'm not too sure what it means. I think but it's the, the financial SMO may be, the yeah, financial that's, 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 order. The order may be over just the settlement sum rather than yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Is that a question or a statement? Um, are are you sure. saying that the financial management order um, just right. is controlling the settlement sum rather than the not settlement sure. start, the settlement sum and the and and the value of, of, of the matrimonial property, they're all sort of included. You can't, everything needs to go into the pool with a binding financial agreement. So if I am under a financial management order, all of my assets that are controlled by the financial management order, so by the, by the trustee, need to go into that binding financial agreement. That is what full and frank financial disclosure is about. Um, so just from the questions, I'm just assuming um, that the person under the financial management order has no assets or, or funds uh, under his or her direct control. It's all being controlled by the New South Wales Department of, of um, Trustee and Guardian. So 
everything needs to go into the agreement um, and then that's why I would imagine that the that the department would need to be involved because they would have direct control um, and authority over those um, over those assets. Right and we're on time and that's it. So thank you for your time everyone today and thank you for your questions. Um, naturally if there's anything else both uh, Leach and I can be reached by our contact details which are there. Um, Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.